Good morning. This is Alan Gassman. I'm here with Christopher DiNicolo and John Beck. I'm in an undisclosed bunker somewhere. John and Chris are in our office, more than six feet apart, and we're going to talk about the governor's new order. Please also join us this afternoon for planning pointers and tomorrow for an in-depth discussion of how the life insurance industry may be adapting to the virus, new developments for medical practices on Wednesday, and then we're going to announce that Chris and John and I are going to do an update on the CARE Act for IRA and pension planning on Thursday, and we'll do something on Friday for Lunch and Learn as well. Thanks for hanging with us. Page three gives you all of the executive orders and primary research materials that we've used to prepare for this webinar. And I'll just take you through these one by one. And then Chris and John will do a lot of uh, detail and cleanup. So as you can see, order 20-94 delays or completely eliminates residential evictions and foreclosures on people's residences in the state of Florida until the until this order is lifted. So that's gonna restrain a lot of people. It's gonna cause a lot of people to not pay their rent or not pay their mortgages, not realizing that the lease agreement and the mortgage agreement will still give the landlord and the bank the ability to call the agreement in breach and kick the tenant or foreclose out the borrower charge the highest rate of interest provided for in the lease or the mortgage amount so don't take missing a payment lightly the, these issues will still apply order 20-87 said that short-term rentals the airbnb industry was basically shut down by the governor I don't, he, I don't think he wanted people from all over the country, and particularly New York, to see how easy it would be to come down and get an Airbnb. So the only Airbnb short-term rentals now allowed are the ones that were in effect when he passed the order a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I was in one at the time. I work in one about half a mile from our office. I extended it to a long-term lease. So it's not a short-term lease, it's over 181 days. And that has helped my marriage tremendously because I work here during the day and go to my other home at night. Then we had the, stay at, the statewide stay-at-home order that the, the uh, governor released. And this had a lot of confusing provisions. In particular, when you read it, and it still says this, senior citizens, must stay home and none of the essential services that they can give or receive are exceptions to the fact that senior citizens must stay home by the letter of the order that the judge signed but the i mean that the governor signed but the governor apparently did not intend it that way because the recent questions and answers that came out specifically say senior citizens can leave their home to receive or give essential services, which includes swimming, hiking, going to uh, religious services, going to the doctor, going to buy things at the store. It's a major danger for the elderly. It leads them to believe that it's safe to go ahead and do all these things at the same time that the CDC is telling us to wear masks. There's nothing about masks in the governor's order. So uh, we're gonna go into more detail, but the order allows now both senior citizens and people with lung conditions, diabetes, cardiac conditions, cancer, et cetera, to also leave their home for all of these essential activities. And in addition, we have lists of essential services because the governor didn't just list what the essential services exceptions were. 
He said you can use the following exceptions. You can use the Miami exceptions. You can use the federal exceptions. And then you have the Miami exceptions, which include keeping auto dealerships open, universities, marinas, veterinarians, pet boarding, I mean, pet boarding. Uh, of course, liquor stores and gun stores are open, as you would expect they would be. Boat launches, docking, fueling of boats, the boat industry is apparently uh, very well represented. So the governor's order took effect April 3rd, 2020. If you are an employer, you really need to make sure that your employees are following these rules. If they get the virus at your place of work and can show that your place of work was not enforcing these rules, they will then say, ah, my, my wife got the virus working at your office where you pressured her to go in there and obviously people were not six feet apart. In fact, here's video clippings of people. They couldn't do their job right unless they were four feet apart. Now my wife has died. I don't think I'm foreclosed by, by workers' compensation because you broke the law. So I think that's a significant risk for employers. Now, what we did was our employees who were senior citizens, we got them out of the building. We told them to stay home. And we're keeping them home because we think that's best for their safety. One question that came up during the governor's conference when he signed the order, he said a senior citizen was age 60. The questions and answers say that a senior citizen is, I mean, I'm sorry, he said a senior citizen is age 65. The questions and answers say that a senior citizen is age 60. But I'm not sure how it really matters now, John and Chris. I'm not sure, if, even though the statute says, and I'll, I'll go to the statute, come up with the uh, language of the statute. This is the article that we published to Forbes last night. You're welcome to Google Forbes Gassman uh, stay and it will come right up for you. But the indented language here on page 12, senior citizens and individuals with significant underlying medical conditions shall stay at home. And then at the bottom, the indented language, the beginning of the second line at the end, all persons in Florida shall limit their movements and personal interactions outside of their home to only those necessary to obtain or provide essential services or conduct essential services. Well, that didn't look like it applied to senior citizens up here. But if it does, then really, Chris and John, is there any difference whatsoever in how this statute applies to senior citizens and how it applies to everyone else? No, it's it's essentially the same. I think you could read this order now as if Section 1A didn't really even exist. Uh, senior citizens are treated just like everyone else, and people with uh, certain health conditions are treated just like everyone else. So it it doesn't it doesn't really speak that well for the legal acumen of whoever in Tallahassee is drafting these orders, interpreting them and releasing questions and answers. But it, it looks like one of the questions and answers was, uh, who's gonna enforce this law? And the answer was, call your local authorities. And then the next question was, will this be enforced against uh, senior citizens who go out of their home for essential services? And it was no. <laughs> so. Right. They're saying, well, we wrote the law, but you need to enforce it in uh, a different way. We also, in the Forbes article, a lot of the attendees here are lawyers, and some of the people here even have friends who are lawyers. So it, it did not say that lawyers are an essential service, but many of the things that we do are essential services, including when we do work for clients who need healthcare directives and healthcare assistance. Uh, also, there's an exception for financial services, and we're certainly staying busy helping clients get positioned and applying for the federal EID, uh, laws, I mean, the federal loans. And then also, it lists uh, the judiciary, anyone working to support the judiciary. 
and we are all officers of the court if we're in the Florida bar, and some of us are involved with litigation, even though our firm doesn't do a lot of litigation. So there's a picture of the governor, in case you didn't know what he looked like, and uh, the mortgage foreclosure and eviction relief order. John and Chris, I promised that I would take eight minutes and give you the rest of this webinar. I took 10 and apologize, and it's all to you now. Thanks, Al. I'm going to go back to the Q&A to drill out on a couple of things. So, you know, as we talked about, the Q&A took a lot of the heat out of the order in terms of who, uh, whether a senior citizen or an individual with significant medical conditions could obtain essential services or provide essential services. And here's the actual language from the Q&A on the bottom of slide four. So it looks like, as John and Alan pointed out, senior citizens are not treated differently. Folks with significant medical conditions are not treated differently and are allowed to follow through on uh, of the essential services, whether they are providing them or obtaining essential goods and services, such as grocery shopping and things of that nature, which is interesting because, you know, the way that it's, it's drafted certainly didn't appear that way at the beginning. I also wanted to point out uh, something else in the Q&A here. This is the third item here on slide five. If the business is not an essential service, must I close the physical location to customers? Notice it says close the physical location to customers. So even if your business is not an essential service, perhaps you can still go into the business if there's no customers and if you maintain the appropriate social distancing measures, and conduct business remotely or business virtually uh, without actually having to interact with customers. Right. And that, this Q&A seems to indicate that. Uh, certainly, they do encourage that folks work from home and do delivery and pickup to the extent possible. But sometimes with resources that we have that at our offices or places of business, it's easier to just go in. And if you don't have any customers, it seems that the Q&A number three might allow you to actually physically be present if you do have those guidelines. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think also that that should give some people some comfort to have some of their employees go in to do things that you have to do uh, in the office, such as going in to collect the mail. If you have a couple employees at the office that are critical to keep the office running, uh, it sounds like the Q&A that this would be allowed. Now, after the general stay-at-home order was issued on, uh, I believe it was Wednesday, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a, a second, quiet, more quietly introduced yeah. order, uh, which is Order 20-92, which said that the state order supersedes then applicable local orders. So if Pinellas County or Hillsborough County had local orders, the governor's stay-at-home order from Wednesday, that's 20-91, would supersede. But here in the Q&A, it's really interesting that they're saying that who is enforcing this? Well, it's local authorities. And our local authorities are allowed to adopt requirements more directly on businesses that might be stricter. And the answer in the Q&A was yes. <laughs> so on Wednesday, the governor's office said this, our order, the governor's office's order, supersedes all local orders. But then later they clarify, well, hold on. The, after our order, apparently, local authorities could issue more stringent and strict requirements uh, and those would be permitted. And when DeSantis spoke about it, he also said that the order actually allowed, was put in place to allow local governments to uh, implement more strict orders. So uh, the language of the order actually seems to be the opposite of the intent. Yeah, it's really interesting and certainly a, a lot of gray area here that we, we would like to see a little more black and white, but perhaps the gray area is needed because this is unprecedented, we don't really, <laughs> we've never been in this place before where we've had to restrict certain interaction uh, without, you know, obviously in, in, in compromising critical infrastructure of our country at large. Uh, and, and to that end, you know, what, what Alan had mentioned was the laundry list of items that are in the governor's stay at home order, the original one that came out on Wednesday. And we're not gonna go over each point, but we wanna let you know that in here, uh, we do have that list, which comes from the Department of Homeland Security's website. It's about 15 or 20 pages long. And then there's a host of other uh, items from the Miami-Dade order, which are a bit more specific uh, than the CDC guidelines. The, the long and short of it is that a lot of these, these, uh, these items can be interpreted very broadly. 
Uh, if we go down to slide 42, we can just show you a couple of examples of how this is uh, how how this reads. Uh, actually, sorry, it's slide number 47. Uh, so, as law firms, for example, you know, it, it was really unclear as to whether law firms would be able to participate, or even general, you know, office support work that's done, if it's payroll services or things of that nature. But if you look at some of these, the way that these uh, sections are couched, workers who support, workers supporting, it's very broad. So it seems like uh, any group, any business or outfit that provides any assistance to one of these industries, uh, that would be okay under these exceptions. Right. Okay. And they did not clarify what support or supporting means. So it's just a general definition and it's open to interpretation. And maybe I guess if we step back and just look at the spirit of all this, it's to stop people from congregating, people from getting together in, in larger groups, uh, people who don't normally interact with each other, from crossing paths, mm -hmm. because the goal here is to reduce the spread of this virus. So I think what we're really hearing from the governor's office and from the local authorities is, you know, let's do what we can as a responsible citizen and not get to a, a, a place where we're going to be interacting with a lot of people and, you know, to the extent possible, stay home. Right. And I think that's what they're getting at here. Yeah. They haven't said, really come out and said it in, in that uh, paraphrasing, but that's what reading the tea leaves, what seems to be intended from all this. Right. And on the next slide, you can see how vague uh, some of these things are. For example, uh, the uh, some of the guidelines say just supporting the judicial system, which could apply to virtually any law firm. And uh, there's an easy argument to be made there. Yeah, I mean, you, you can even say that, that the, the company that delivers paper to a courthouse right. might be supporting the judicial system or mm -hmm. delivers trash bags or whatever the case may be. And, <laughs> you know, so long as these social distancing guidelines are met, I think the spirit of the, of the law and the rule here is to allow the business to continue. Um, you know, we certainly don't want to eliminate critical functions. At the same time, we want to make sure that we're not having groups of people getting together and people touching the same thing over and over right. so as to reduce the spread of the virus. Right. And, and I think the next slide of where we talk about financial transactions and services, every business enters into financial transactions and, and every transaction goes towards supporting our economy and our market. Uh, so pretty much it seems like any business can make the argument that they are essential. Now, one thing that we did get from the Q&A is what penalties will apply for non-compliance? And according to the Q&A, uh, local law enforcement is indeed enforcing these rules, uh, but violation of the governor's executive order is considered a second-degree misdemeanor. So it's still, you know, it's still a criminal infraction to not comply here. It's kind of hard to get assessed with a criminal infraction, which you don't know what, what's prohibited and what's not prohibited. Um, Alan, I don't know if you have any thoughts as to how this might be enforced and might be applied. Well, we know we know that our local judicial system in, uh, issued a proclamation that there will be no bail. That if you're picked up and you are jailed because of a violation of these rules, and you have symptoms of the virus, then you're going to stay in jail without bond for 30 days, which is going to expose you a lot more to the virus than you would have been exposed. Right. And in other, you don't just have to have symptoms, even if there's reasonable cause to believe that the person was exposed to it, uh, you could be thrown in jail for 30 days uh, without bonds. I don't know how that will be enforced, but. I well, once a, few, once a few people are on the news being in jail for 30 days because they had a party at their house, then I think maybe word will get out that people should take this more seriously. I wanted to talk a little bit about swimming because I was just surprised that he put the word swimming. First of all, I used to be a camp counselor. So when you go swimming, you make sure that there's a lifeguard or you make sure that there's a buddy because drowning is one of the highest causes of death in the state of Florida. Well, if I'm out there swimming and I am having a problem, who's going to come save me and expose themselves to the virus? Who's going to give me CPR? And if I swim in a lake, how do I know the virus isn't all over that lake? So it, it really struck me uh, 
don't tell your kids to go swimming unless you yeah. only have one kid. You don't want to be in, in a water where the water gets in your eyes, your mouth, your ears. That's where the virus comes in. So that one I just thought was, um, you know, if it wasn't such a serious I, problem, I would have thought it was humorous to say swimming. Why not just say wrestling too? Yeah, well, certainly I know golf courses are closed. Uh, that's something that you know, was not listed here, but the way that recreational activities are defined, it says recreational activity such as, and it lists an example. Uh, so, you know, it's not like they're prohibiting everything else, but I guess they want people to use their common sense here. And, you know, maybe maybe a tackle football game at the park isn't the best idea, um, you know, but certainly you drive by and see tennis courts and they're full. People are playing tennis and I don't know if they're wearing gloves on the, uh, on, on the, the hand that handles the ball. Who knows? But, you know, some, some of these rules are really kind of designed to provide a framework to just get people to, to stay inside, use their common sense, I think. Right. All right. So, as promised, we have the laundry list of items here. It begins at page 64. So, you know, I encourage you to look through these if you do have any questions on your specific situation. I will note that the federal rules here that I'm, I'm flying through are very broad. Uh, if we get down the Miami-Dade order, which follows this, uh, it's a lot more specific. And it, it's got things like grocery stores, uh, newspaper stores, banks, uh, laundromats, dry cleaners, restaurants, but only for takeout and delivery services, gas stations, et cetera, uh, which is, I would think it's a little bit more helpful for us, right? Just to see what we can and can't do. Yeah, definitely. It, it provides a little bit more guidance and a little bit more clarity. But um, as we mentioned earlier, there's still a lot of gray area here. For example, when we talk about professional services, such as legal or accounting, it says uh, when, necess when um, it's for providing legally mandated services, but we don't really know what's legally mandated. Anything that's legal? I, I, don't, I don't know how to interpret that. Uh, and then maybe. what about hygiene products? Anyone who sells hygiene products can stay open. Yeah, so right. if, uh, if a hair salon sells shampoo, that means they can stay open and still do hair. I don't. Uh, and then pet care. So I guess the pet care means that anyone who does doggy nails and doggy shampoos and blowouts can stay in, can stay in business. But I think we can, we can let everyone who's on this webinar go through these lists. You've got our PowerPoint. The PowerPoint includes every essential activity. You can go through these for yourself and for your clients. And John and Chris, is there anything else that leaps off these pages, or should we let all these people go back to the go back to their uh, spouses, families, and working, or probably a lot of them are going swimming? Yeah, I, <laughs> I think that uh, that about covers it now, and uh, really the Things to focus on, you know, or just if you have anything for special situation. The Q and A doesn't provide a whole lot, but it does provide a lot without saying so much. Right. Uh, so I, I would encourage folks to just take a look at that at the beginning of our presentation, and then go ahead and consult these lists for your specific situation. Then I would say, if you're a financial, uh, if you're a professional, or you're going to be go doing a payroll loan. Go to Forbes blog, just Google Forbes Nitty, N-I-T-T-I, loans, and check out what he what Tony Nitty, also known as the tax geek, my hero, uh, wrote in an article yesterday where if you're applying for the PPP loan, there's some real open issues as to whether, for example, you're going to apply for it based on your payroll from 2019 or whether you can use the fiscal year ending January 30, 31st or February 28th. Different banks are doing different things on that, whether you have to reduce the measurement of what you can borrow by two and a half times past payroll taxes and some other issues. So if you're filling out these applications for clients, we're going to update everybody on this on Thursday in a webinar Thursday and then in our uh, Limeburg uh, webinars as well, but stay open with that. In addition, there's a nice list that we can send you if you ask. Just send us an email uh, for IRS letter. There was a very good letter sent by the AICPA 
uh, to the Treasury Department, which summarizes all of the different tax reporting obligations that are still in place. Where you, if you have a foreign owner of a trust, do you still have to disclose it by April 15th? If you have, uh, if you've recently made an S election, do you have to file your 2553 within 75 days? There's a lot of these things that have not been relieved yet, and these are in the letter. We'll be covering them in subsequent webinars, but if you want a copy of that, let me know. John, Chris, everyone listening, thanks very much. We welcome all your questions, comments, suggestions, and corrections, because we're not always right, and may the rest of your day be billable. Thank you.